Welcome to video five, but day four of my research field work trip around the English Channel. Um, I'm doing this research for my PhD at the University of Bristol, uh, where I'm researching the maritime knowledge uh, behind the Norman invasion of England in 1066. Today's video is about my day in Fécamp. Uh, yesterday's video was us getting into uh, Fécamp, and um, you can see today the um, the weather was far more settled. It uh, became a really beautiful day, actually, which is good because I did an awful lot of walking around and saw a lot of things. Um, so I look forward to sharing those with you in this video. I hope you enjoy. So as you can see, the entrance to Fécamp Harbour um, was a much different experience to the previous night. And um, you can see that marker it was one of the lights that was leading us in. Uh, they were, there was one on either side of the harbour. It's much easier to appreciate that entrance in the daylight, um, but it shows just why it's so important to do all the preparation and planning and looking at the charts and reading all of the channel pilot directions uh, before you enter a harbour so that you have um, a mental image, if not an actual picture, in your mind when, you, when you're approaching. So we knew those lights were there and the, the guidance tells you which lights you have to line up and, um, and they're numbered and things like that. So it's really important that you do that background research but it's nice to see when things actually go to plan. I'm, um, I'm making this video in saint valery sur somme at the moment and I'm smiling while I'm saying that because the um, entrance to this uh, harbour was very different. Uh, it's very complicated and I'll do a separate video on that uh, when I get to it. But yeah, the, when the markers are correct, it makes a huge difference. I'll say that much. So after hanging up all of our waterproofs to dry in the good weather, after last night soaking, well it was last night and all day yesterday actually, it was about 10 hours of soaking, um, we headed off to the celebration of the Coquille Saint-Jacques um, because it's the end of the season for fishing for scallops at the moment. So there's a big celebration on the quay front in um, Fécamp where people would be cooking the scallops and there was musicians um, and this group were the sea shanty singers, um, the Coeur de Ipo, which is the next town along um, and I've got a little clip here of their, um, their singing. <laughs> So after scallops and sea shanties, we headed off to Abbey of La Trinité in Fécamp, which was founded, refounded rather, after um, the previous um, incarnation being destroyed um, in the Viking attacks in the 9th century. Um, Fécamp was refounded by the then Duke of Normandy, uh, Richard I, and it was a major site for the ducal family. Um, they had a palace opposite, which I'll visit later in this video, and um, the abbey itself was um, very important within Normandy, but also with uh, regards to the Norman invasion. The um, abbey had a representative involved in the um, number of ships contributed, uh, Remedius of Fécamp. He was the almoner um, of the abbey, but we also have um, some references to monks that accompanied the invasion fleet who went to Harold, um, the King of England, and um, tried to negotiate with him before the battle, and those monks probably came from Fécamp as well. So Fécamp's a really interesting place in my research. They also have a, a very big fishing industry um, and salt working and various other maritime interests in the 11th century that I'm going to explore within my research. The Ducal Palace at Fécamp is right opposite the Abbey and it was much favoured by the Dukes of Normandy, uh, William the Conqueror and his ancestors. Um, going back to Richard I who refounded um, the Abbey, he was born at Fécamp in the Ducal Palace there so he had a close connection to that place. 
It's also possible to suggest that Fécamp was important to William the Conqueror as he spent Easter, which is the most important um, festival in the Christian calendar in the 11th century. He spent that Easter after his um, conquest of England in 1067 at Fécamp. So um, that place may be um, represented in the Via Tapestry, perhaps. The next place that I visited was the Chapelle uh, Notre Dame du Salut at the top of Cape Fagné, which is 110 feet above sea level and is the highest point in the Alabaster Coast. And you can see it just here. The Chapelle Notre Dame du Salut, uh, the Chapel of Our Lady of Salvation, um, is according to legend um, founded by William the Conqueror's father, Robert, Duke of Normandy. Um, and there's several legends um, for clip-top uh, chapels around Normandy that they were they were promised um, by various of the dukes uh, that they would be built um, following survival after shipwreck or uh, difficulty at sea. So it's interesting that this one is um, is regarding uh, Duke William's father Robert, um, but the place, the location upon um, upon the cliff is um, an ideal sea mark for views from the sea so when we were coming into this harbour we saw the lights up there in uh, just along from the chapel so it's a high point which means that you can see the lights from further out but um, there's also a Gallo-Roman oppidum built up there um, there are fortifications from World War Two, and then there are also um, ruins of a priory which were have been converted into a modern house and they've been um, been there since the chapel gained more um, people going there to to give offerings and it became richer um, and it was particularly the case uh, during the expansion of the Normandy fishing into Newfoundland. As you can see the views are quite spectacular um, from this point you can see all the way to um, the next town along uh, Ypres and you can see right the way around the coast uh, around that corner you'll find Etretat and you can see quite far out to sea as well if you could get to the edge of Cap Fagny but um, there was a cliff fall on the 22nd of February uh, this year, 2023, which means that that part of the coast is now inaccessible because it's not safe to be there. But I walked down to the bottom of the cliff and along to uh, look back at where that cliff fall was and you can see just how significant it is, just how much chalk was lost. The final place that I visited in Fécamp was the museum and um, it's in the old fish processing building. The museum um, is the entire maritime history of Fécamp. Um, it doesn't have anything from the 11th century sadly um, but they did have some wonderful artworks which showed how the um, coast had looked before the modernisation and the, the port facilities that were built so um, I really enjoyed looking at those. There was an entire floor of the museum dedicated to the fishing industry in Fécamp and I was particularly interested to see the drift nets um, which the exhibition said had been uh, very similar between the 13th and the 20th centuries um, as well as the processing of the fish and the methods um, who did that work and again these were apparently very similar methods um, to those undertaken during the medieval period. So this is uh, also an area that I'm going to research more so that I can see what sort of industries were active in the coastal zone of Normandy during the 11th century. Um, potentially these are people with maritime knowledge um, and skills that Duke William may have had the opportunity to call upon um, in the preparations for his invasion, but this is something that I'd, uh, I'd like to explore further. Finally, um, when in Fécamp, one must go and see the Fécamp hoard, which is um, an absolutely enormous hoard of around 10,000 coins uh, dating from the late 10th century. And um, some of them are depicted here. Some of them are on loan to Museo Sen uh, for their exhibition that's on at the moment. I'm going to try and go to see 
uh, later in the year when I'm back in France anyway. Um, and yeah, the treasure, the Facon Horde rather, um, is a treasure certainly. And it's uh, got, I think, at least 40 uh, mints represented, English and French. So it's um, by far the largest collection that gives us an indication of the um, movement of coinage and the interactions that were going on in the in the late 10th century um, and i think it's very interesting that it was uh, discovered at Fécamp, uh due to the connections with the ducal family and uh, and the potential for maritime interactions from this place in the in the 11th century and earlier but um, i'm not a numismatist and um I am only just beginning to delve into the literature on this subject, but uh, yeah, it's a very interesting area to be researching and there's lots of different things I think that I'm um, finding in my research. Uh, maritime activity touches so many different specialisms because the sea connects people, um, it doesn't divide. Uh, so yeah, it's just a really interesting thing to be researching and um, I hope I'm getting across just how excited and interested I am in this. In um, in this research that I'm doing and I'm, I'm very very lucky and very very grateful that uh, I've got the opportunity to be able to do it. So that's the end of this video. Um, I'm trying to catch up as best I can. Uh, it's a lot easier when I've had more sleep. Um, I struggle to to string the words together because I'm just sitting in my in my bunk sort of making these videos while we're actually on the boat uh, in the evenings after very full days of either sailing or making the most of my time in the port so um, I hope they're they're all right and um, people are enjoying them and I look forward to sharing the next installment when I get a chance to to sit down and make uh, make a video and I hope this one's uh, redeemed the the shortcomings of the last video so thank you very much and I'll hopefully make another one soon.